welcome to today's Cambridge University Press ELT webinar. I'm delighted to welcome Evelina Golotzi as today's presenter. Evelina is a member of the Research and Thought Leadership Group at Cambridge English Language Assessment. She has extensive experience as a teacher, teacher trainer and program administrator and has delivered training courses on language assessment in North America, Asia and Europe. At Cambridge English, her research focuses on speaking assessment and the role of assessment in supporting learning. So, over Evelina. Thank you very much, Alistair, and welcome to all of you. It's such a pleasure to look through the chat box and to see the countries that you're from. We have people from the Ukraine, Brazil, Russia, Peru, Italy, and it's uh, it's fantastic to see so much interest in this in this webinar. So. As you can see from the slide, the focus is on learning-oriented assessment and we, or I rather, have tried to, will try to make it as relevant as an, and as practical for you as possible. Okay, so let's take a look at what I hope together we can accomplish today. I'm going to focus on three different blocks in the presentation. So in the first block, I'm going to look at exploring formative and summative assessment. And these are maybe terms you're familiar with. And if not, I'll explain them in a bit more detail. Also, then we're going to move on to look at basic concepts about learning-oriented assessment. And I might refer to it as LOA, so since it's a little bit shorter, so learning-oriented assessment. And then we're going to look at some examples of learning-oriented assessment in practice, because I think that that's going to be the most relevant part of the webinar for you. OK, now let's start with a very quick question for you. I've given you four examples of different kinds of assessment that you might do. And they are, number one, this is an example of assessment, monitoring learners' language while they do group work and noting down errors. Another kind of assessment, number two, is doing a proficiency test at the end of secondary school. Number three is asking learners to complete a self-evaluation with can-do statements about their performance. And the fourth example is taking a test of academic English as part of admissions into university. Now think about these four different examples I've given you. If you had to put them in two different categories, in two different groups, which exams would you put together? So think of the four examples and decide how would you put them in different groups? Which examples would you put together? Is it monitoring errors while learners do some group work? Is it a proficiency test? completing a self-evaluation and taking a test of academic English. So a lot of people actually I'm seeing from your responses are saying are putting two and four together and one and three together. And you're using words such as one and three are formative, two and four are summative and so on. And I agree with that. I would definitely say if um, if I had to categorize these, I might put them, I might categorize them in this way. So one and three going together and two and four are in a different in a different group. So this is traditionally, I would say, the way we look at assessment. We have categories that we've used um, to categorize different kinds of assessment. And often we talk about summative assessment and formative assessment. And actually, these were exactly the terms that you used in responding to my, to my question. Also, we often talk about standardized assessment and classroom assessment two different ways of thinking about assessment and some of you used the word classroom when responding to the previous task. Also, sometimes we talk about assessment in terms of assessment of learning and assessment for learning. And traditionally, these ways of looking at assessment, I would say, have been very much categorized or very much presented in terms of dichotomies and oppositions. So you've got either the camp doing summative standardized assessment of learning or you've got the people doing formative classroom and assessment for learning. So they're very much presented as a dichotomy or a contrast in opposition. And let's see what those different kinds of assessment were traditionally seen as doing. So we have the formative classroom assessment for learning approach. And that assessment is often seen as ongoing. It's something that the teacher does throughout the learning process. It is also seen as assessment which responds to the evolving needs of learners. So it's very much uh, a flexible way of, of assessing because it responds to what the learners need. 
It's also a type of assessment that is seen as assessment that emphasizes interaction, it emphasizes support for the learners and development of the learners. It is also seen as assessment which lacks reliability and validity because it's something that the teacher does on a small scale in the classroom. Okay, so that's one side of how traditionally we can conceptualize this formative classroom side of assessment. Let's look at the other side of this, of this dichotomy. We have here the summative standardized assessment of learning approach. And traditionally, this kind of assessment is seen as something that is done at the end of a period of study. So you do it summatively at the end. It is often linked to a syllabus or a theoretical model. It is designed with validity and reliability in mind. So there's, there's, a, there's a quality assurance procedure behind it which makes sure that the summative standardized tests are um, are tests with validity and reliability. And often this kind of assessment is perceived as just grading. The purpose of this test is often seen as you just need to produce a grade at the end for each student. Now these are the two dichotomies, the two camps in a way, of the way assessment has been has been conceptualized. However, and this is how this is where I want to change your thinking a little bit today, I think this is possibly not a very useful distinction a distinction of either one or the other. I think it's more useful to think about assessment, and that includes formative and summative assessment, in terms of a continuum. So it's not two categories, it's not two groups, but it is a continuum. It is a line with different tests along this continuum. And I say this because often, if you look at assessment tasks, you can often say that there actually are learning tasks. So assessment tasks do, in fact, um, have that learning aspect to them. And also learning tasks are, in fact, often assessment tasks. Think of how often in the classroom you do informal assessment through the learning tasks that you give your learners. So even though it's simple to think of assessment in terms of summative and formative, it is actually not such a clear-cut division because often the summative summative tests can be used formatively. For example, if you give your learners, let's say, a Cambridge um, proficiency test, what you do afterwards with the test can be used very formatively because you're helping your learners focus on their strengths and weaknesses. Or you can use a formative test in a summative way. So I would say that this distinction of formative and summative is possibly oversimplifying the way we look at assessment because ultimately all kinds of assessment we do needs to provide evidence for learning. And evidence for learning can be seen both in the formative and summative approach to assessment. And here's a quote. I, I just wanted to give you this one quote from someone called Carlis, who is a researcher in learning and assessment. And I think this captures very well what the, 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 the purpose or the function of assessment should be. And he says that for all assessments, whether predominantly summative or formative, a key aim is to promote productive student learning. So that really is the key, not putting assessment in terms of summative or formative, but thinking how does this assessment support learning? How does it promote productive student learning? That really, I would say, is the key question you as teachers need to be asking yourselves every time you go into a classroom or every time you give uh, a, a test at the end of a unit of, of, uh, of, of study. How does this assessment support learning? And I've given you an image here just to capture that point that all the activities that teachers do, all the learning checks, all the tests, whether they are formative or summative, but all the assessments they do, they need to come together to lead to this arc of learning and they need to support it in, in, standing, in standing up. And I believe that the best way for assessment to support learning is when we integrate learning and assessment. And this, this is the key aspect of learning-oriented assessment. I want you to, one of the key aspects I want you to take away, the idea of integration of learning and assessment, not seeing assessment as something that happens in the classroom and that's formative, and then something happens at the, happens at the end and that's summative, but to see assessment as something that is much more closely integrated throughout the learning process. And this is where I believe that learning-oriented assessment comes in. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some um, aspects or some of the key features of learning-oriented assessment, and then we'll think about them in a little bit more detail. So here are some of the key 
position points, some of the key tenets, tenets of learning-oriented assessment. One of them is that when you integrate learning and assessment, you need to set clear learner objectives. Because if the learners know what the objectives of learning are, and if the teachers know what the objectives of learning are, then it's much clearer what checks on learning you need to be doing throughout. It is much clearer what exactly you need to be assessing at the end of that, at the end of that stretch, of, stretch of learning. Another key point of learning-oriented assessment is that progress needs to be tracked regularly. So progress shouldn't be something that you, as a teacher, you, 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 you monitor at the beginning of the term, let's say, at the beginning of the course, then in the middle and at the end. But progress is something that needs to be tracked again and again and again on a regular basis, continuously. And again, we go back to the formative and summative distinction. You can do this with summative types of tasks. You can do it with formative types of tasks. But the key point here is that it's something that must be done on a regular basis. Another key element of learning-oriented assessment is that it is important to use a frame of reference. For example, the CEFR, which stands for the Common European Framework of Reference. And this is important because this is what brings much more transparency and clarity to what the learners are aiming towards. So if, for example, you're teaching learners, but you don't quite know what level they're at or what level you'd like them to be, go to, or you don't quite know what they can do and what they can't do, the teaching is possibly not so effective. But if you have a clear idea that you're teaching learners at, let's say, level A2, and this is what they can do, and this is what they can't do, as described in the CFR, for example, and you'd like to get them from level A2, which is high beginner, to level B1, which is intermediate, that is a much, much more effective way of approaching, approaching um teaching and assessment. Another key element of learning-oriented assessment is that it does encourage learning inside and outside the classroom. Because a lot of, a lot of homework tasks, for example, tasks that you give your learners to do outside of school, they are assessment tasks in a way, because they give them an opportunity to check their learning. So learning is not just something that happens inside the classroom an assessment alongside learning, but it's something that is both inside and outside the classroom. And I'll give you examples of this later on. Another key element of learning-oriented assessment is that there's a constant adjusting of the teaching cycle. And this happens because as you're tracking progress regularly and as you're integrating assessment and learning, you're putting a lot of learning checks throughout the, 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 the journey that the students are taking. And the data that you collect from those learning checks then help you as a teacher to decide what to do next day, the next day in the classroom. So they help you to adjust the teaching cycle and what exactly you're going to do based on the data you've collected from all the assessment checks that you've done on students' learning. And I would say that another key feature of learning-oriented assessment is that it supports autonomous learners. Now, autonomous learners means that learners who, have, who take responsibility of their own learning. They don't expect a teacher to always tell them what to do. And this approach to assessment, as you see later, really does um, encourage more learner autonomy. OK, so this is, this is in a nutshell, what learning-oriented learning assessment is. But maybe you're sitting in your, uh, sitting, um, in your uh, classroom or, or, or home right now, and you're thinking, but what is the big deal? This is what I do on a regular basis. I've known these concepts all this time. And I think that's actually a really, really good thought to have. And one of the main points about learning-oriented assessment is that these are not new components. The features of learning-oriented assessment, let's say, tracking progress, adjusting the teaching cycle, setting clear objective. That is something that is familiar to teachers. But I would say that this is possibly something that novice teachers don't do as well as, as uh, experienced teachers. So I think the key point here is that we're moving away from teacher intuition, which is what a lot of experienced teachers would do, to a systematic framework, a systematic approach to assessment. So it means that all teachers need to be considering that integration of learning and assessment and not just believing that this is something they should be doing, but, but not doing it in a, in a completely systematic way. 
Okay, so I've given you an overview of formative and summative assessment, and I've hopefully managed to show you that there's a slightly different way of approaching assessment, which is to look at it as um, not assessment in two camps, but assessment that should always be supporting learning. And these are really a set of familiar components, but we're trying to put them into one systematic framework. Now let's take a break now from thinking about learning-oriented assessment, and let's take a look at the job of the teacher. Okay, so in an ideal world, this is what teachers do on a regular basis every single time they stand in front of a classroom. So in an ideal world, they set clear learning objectives. So that's always very much of the teaching. In an ideal world, teachers identify suitable tasks and they deliver those tasks effectively. In an ideal world, teachers assess how the students are doing, and they encourage the students to self-assess themselves. In an ideal world, teachers provide feedback on the performance, and they encourage self and peer feedback as well. And also, teachers adjust future learning outcomes and lessons in response to this. So I would say this is what happens ideally. Now, could you say, hand on your heart, that this is something that you do every single time you stand in front of a classroom? Possibly not. So let's, take, let's think a little bit and give me your ideas in the chat box. What are some challenges that teachers face in doing their job? What are some challenges that they have to uh, deal with so that which, which prevent them from always doing um, all of the, the, the elements of ideal teaching that I've listed? OK, so I'm seeing that uh, people are saying time constraints, time, time shortage. Another person says we all stick to the syllabus. Um, large groups of students is also an idea coming up. The involvement of the students, enough time to provide feedback regularly. These are fantastic ideas, by the way, and I completely agree with them. Students' motivation is coming up, the experience of the teacher, time, the objectives, lack of motivation. I completely agree. So there are issues that teachers have to deal with, and I've just summarized them very quickly for you here, and they do actually, I think, what I've put up overlaps more or less with what you've been telling me. Let me just take a little bit of time to look at a few more of your responses. So students are unwilling to learn. We have the motivation issue. Um, students are reluctant to learn, says Natalia. Again, that's to do with motivation. Um, and um, the class size, Rana, and so on. All right, so here's what I've put up. And this, this is the time issue. The picture that I've put up, um, put up, I'm hoping, symbolizes that. And a lot of you have said that teachers don't have time to do all of those things in an ideal world. And that's the reality of our profession, unfortunately, because the demands on us are very, very high. Teachers also teach in very large classes. And this is something that, that some of you mentioned in the chat box. I've given you a picture here, which is actually not such a large class. But do take it as a symbol of, of a teacher having to deal with a lot of a lot of students, and what happens is that when you don't have enough time and when you have large classes, it's very difficult to prepare activities that are personalized to every single student, and it's very difficult to keep detailed records of the student's achievement and progress. And uh, um, this, is, this is the reality that, that all of the teachers face. And also, in a large class, you have often mixed ability students. So not being able to target every student's needs leads to, to lower motivation and so on. And what teachers do, what all of us do in a mixed ability class, is we teach to the middle. We forget about the top and the bottom because we, need to, we go for the middle, which is where a lot of students would be. But we're not targeting every student's needs. And the third challenge that I've put here, which interestingly none of you mentioned, or maybe I missed it, but not many of you mentioned, is the idea of technology. And I think um, using technology in the classroom in a meaningful way and also having facilities to use technology is possibly another challenge that the teachers, teachers face. And Ludmilla, I see here, is saying lack of IT classes. I agree with you, Ludmilla. I think that um, the use of technology in the classroom 
is a is is a challenge because teachers don't necessarily have the training for it, and also the students themselves don't necessarily know um, uh, know what what to do. So these are some challenges for teachers. I would say another challenge is learner autonomy. It's um, the autonomy of learners is something that, that sounds fantastic to all of us. We all want to have autonomous learners who take charge of their learning. But let me ask you these questions. Think about your learners. So, do your learners understand the goals of each lesson? Do your learners work in pairs without the teacher's direct supervision? Do your learners complete work outside the class in addition to homework? Do your learners look for opportunities to practice their English? And do your learners understand their strengths and weaknesses? I would say that we can say yes to these questions for some of our learners, but probably not for all, because it is very difficult, in fact, for learners to be autonomous without having very specific um, very specific training in how they can be autonomous. So there's that reliance on the teacher and reliance on an overstretched teacher to help learners learn. All right, so let's go back now to learning oriented assessment. Now these are the six elements of assessment, of learning oriented assessment which I mentioned. So the idea of setting clear objectives for the learners, tracking progress regularly, using a frame of reference, for example the CFR, assessing and learning inside and outside the classroom, adjusting the teaching, style, teaching cycle and supporting autonomous learners. Now as, as uh, we agree I think this is, um, th these concepts are familiar concepts but also they're difficult to apply by, by teachers because of issues such as time, mixed ability classes, limited motivation by learners. And I think that this is where learning oriented assessment with the use of digital tools is, is, is a concept that can help teachers because that concept attempts to pull everything together, all the um, aspects of teaching which support learners and it does it can only pull it together and and help teachers apply it to a, to a larger scale through the use of technology because technology is the, the the one element of this of this equation that makes learning oriented learning oriented assessment possible i believe now enough of me just talking and telling you about uh, theoretical concepts of lot learning oriented assessment is, I want to now show you learning oriented assessment in practice, LOA in practice. And I've chosen two products which um, uh, come from Cambridge English and um, they, one of them is, is an English language teaching course material and that's the picture on the left, the Empower, and the other one is an example of a digital app called Cambridge English Write and Improve. And what I'm going to do is I'll just talk you through these two examples that I've that I've chosen, and uh, and I'll I'll show you I'll hopefully illustrate how they embody some principles of learning oriented assessment. Okay, so let's start with the first example, which is the Cambridge English Empower course. That is a six-level language course, which goes from level A1, which is beginner, up to level C1, which is which is um, uh, an advanced level and it breaks levels B into three levels. So there is B1, B2, and B2 higher. Okay, so a six-level language course. And the unique element of this course is that it integrates learning and assessment. And if you remember, that's one of the key elements of learning-oriented assessment, is that integration and regular use of assessment and learning um, going hand in hand. So let's take a look at what this course looks like and why I've chosen it. I've given you um, an image from one of the pages, one of the spreads of the of the book. So this comes from a unit, unit 7C in this case, and it comes from part of a unit which, which focuses on everyday English. So there's a topic in the book, you, you, you work on the topic through grammar, vocabulary, reading, listening, writing, and then in part of the, of the um, unit you focus on everyday English expressions connected to this topic. And what is interesting about this, and the reason I've chosen it, is that this course book has unit progress tests. 
And that's important because there, there's a progress test. That means there's a learning check at the end of every unit, not just at the beginning, the middle, and the end of the course, or not even just at the end of the course, which happens very often. But there are continuous, regular, built-in learning checks at the end of every single unit. And here are the three kinds of uh, tests that you might see. So there's a unit progress test. and that is learned, that is linked. Let me just circle it for you. So that's the top one in the image that I've given you. So you have unit progress test, as I said, at the end of every single unit. And those tests are linked to personalized learner pathways so that the way a learner performs on one of these progress tests determines what extension activities they need to do. So here's an example. If a learner, let's say, um, took a grammar test because that's part of the that's part of the unit progress test there's a grammar test in there depending on how they performed the system not the teacher but the system is going to provide extension activities for that learner so let's say that they got a mark a score of 0 to 3 which is actually a very very low mark they're going to get an extension activity which presents the language again possibly in a different way, so that they, they have the opportunity to repeat what, what um, the teacher has presented. And I'm, I'm seeing a question here. I'll just quickly respond. This is targeted for, for adults, mostly. Um, uh, if, the, if, the learner perf if the learner takes the test and gets a mark, a score of, let's say, 4 to 5, they might be given an extension activity um, that, that allows them to practice what they've learned in a slightly more controlled, simple way because they haven't performed so well, so the practice would be targeted to, to lower levels of understanding but still extend what they've learned. If they get a score of 6 to 7, for example, they might be given a different practice which is slightly more advanced, and if they get a very, very high score, they would be given an extension activity, which is often a reading and listening one. So the point here, the point I want to illustrate here, is that the way there are assessment checks built, in, built into the coursework at coursework into the coursebook at regular intervals, and there is very and the opportunity um, learners get to to practice the language is very personalized because the way they perform on these tests then gives them different kinds of of, uh, of learning experiences after that, and we've called this personalized learner pathways. Now, I think you would agree this is what teachers would do anyway as well, but it's very difficult to do this kind of thing with 35 students and to provide different kinds of extension activities for every student. So that's where the technology is really supporting the teacher here, because this is also something the, t the students can do outside of the classroom. Classroom time doesn't have to be spent doing the extension activities or the, doing different extension activities. So the technology is really becoming an assistant here to the teacher in personalizing content and providing it for the learners after they've learned from the teacher. And so here are two, two just key uh, concepts for you to take away from this. This helps teachers to do differentiated teaching. Differentiated teaching means you are differentiating the content you give and the learning experiences and the teaching based on what the learners need. And as I said, the teacher cannot do this with 36 students, but the technology can help the teacher do it in a more, in a more efficient, useful way. Now, here's another kind of test. As I said, there are different kinds of tests built in. So I've just given you an example of a grammar or, or, or a lexical unit progress test. But what makes Empower very different and very unique is that every unit also has a speaking test. And this is very unusual because speaking is incredibly difficult to test. And you need a lot of time. You need human, human beings and teachers and examiners to do it. So what Empower does is it uses voice recognition software and automated assessment to provide immediate scores on speaking. So that's a key element of this course. It focuses on speaking, and that's an element of learning-oriented assessment because the focus is on the four skills and not just the easy skills. So there's a focus on speaking as well as the other skills. And also, it provides immediate scores for the learners. So again, they're getting that data. They're getting the, the, the data that tells them, yes, this is something that you've learned, or this is something that you've mastered in terms of speaking in this unit. This isn't. So, so that gives them information to, to go back and, um, 
and possibly redo it or to extend their learning. And I've chosen just one example to give you from the speaking test. An example I've chosen is a word stress task. So there are different task types in the speaking. There could be a task that focuses on deciding how many syllables there are in a word and pronouncing the word with, with the, the correct number of syllables. There could be a task that focuses on specific sounds. So for example, the, the difference between long and short e, so e and e, or th and d. There could be tasks which focus on word stress, which is the example I've given you. And the, the, um, the key point about this task is that the learners do it and they get an immediate score. They can also do it as many times as they want. They don't just get one shot at this. They don't get just one try, but they can try it as many times as want, recording themselves, listening to themselves, and then they submit it to the voice recognition software in the automated assessment for a score. Not all tasks are as, as uh, controlled as this, there are also more extended tasks, for example, reading aloud, which you can argue is perhaps to control, is perhaps controlled as well. And um, also, there are tasks which ask learners to provide a response to a question. So, for example, there could be a question or a topic such as, tell me about your holiday, or at high levels, it could be, um, it could be something to do with personality, introverted, extroverted personality. So there's a longer stretch of speech that can also be assessed by the machine. So these are the speaking tests. And um, the final kind of test are the competency tests. These are tests which are taken at the middle point and at the end of the, of the uh, course. And they, they provide learners the opportunity to try um, more extended tests. So the example I've chosen here to give you here is from a listening test. So in this case, the learners are told that they'll hear five short conversations, and after each question, they need to choose the correct picture. So a listening test, which is visually very, very appealing, and um, the learners have to have to uh, try this test, and there are several, several parts to it. OK, another element of this, of this um, course book is the grade book. And remember, I said one of the key elements of learning-oriented assessment is the fact that you need to collect data on a regular basis. You need to know what's, how your learners are performing. This is where the technology can help, can, can s step in to assist the teacher as well, because it provides the teacher a record, the teacher and the students, I should say, with a record of how, the, how they're performing. So the students can, can see their, their own performance, and the teacher can see the performance of individual students and also the performance of the whole class. So this idea of record keeping is automated here. The technology, again, stepping in to help the teacher. And that's an element of learning-oriented assessment, because record keeping like this helps you adjust what you teach. It helps you take that data into account to determine what will be the best, the best uh, teaching focus the next, uh, the next time you see those learners. And another aspect of, of this course is that the students get a student report at the end of completing it. And what's that's not so unusual in itself. That's what the teacher can give as well. But what is interesting and useful here is that this report is based on an external framework. In this case, the, com the Common European Framework of Reference, the CFR. So if you look at the bottom of the chart, we have um, different elements of progression. So we have progressing towards A2. Now, this is a learner who took an A2 level course. Okay, So that's why we've got A2 at the bottom. So progressing towards A2, close to A2, A2 level achieved, good performance and strong performance against A2. And you have this for all the four skills, not just the skills which are easy to assess, such as reading and, and listening, but all four skills are here. So this is very useful for a student and a teacher, because now they can see what exam they might be ready to take if they want to move on to a, uh, a certificated test. So this was an example. This was the first example I chose, which is a course book. Now I would like to show you another example, which is much smaller. This is a smaller entity. This is not a course book. This is only a digital app. I've chosen it, though, because it's a very, very useful app for, 
helpful learners. And it's useful because it provides automated feedback on writing. So learners can go into, into this app, which is called Cambridge English Write and Improve. They provide some writing, and they get feedback on their writing. And it's feedback on three levels. They get script level feedback on the overall piece of writing. They get sen sentence level feedback and word level feedback as well. I have a short video which I hope will play and will illustrate this a little bit a little bit better. So Alistair, could we show the video please? Thank you. To get started. To get started, choose a writing task from the list. The tasks are there to help you think of what to write. For example, you choose to write about the internet and websites. You won't be marked on your ability to answer the question, just your writing. Now simply enter your text in the box. If you're not quite ready to submit your writing, you can save and return to your work at any time. When you're ready, click Save and Submit. The system will then assess your writing. The top result is your overall score. This is assigned on a scale from red to green. Red is for text that looks like it may be at CEFR level B1 or below. And green shows evidence of being at CEFR level B2 or above. Under Detailed Feedback, there are three tabs. Combined, Error Feedback and Sentence Feedback. Combined gives you all the details from Error Feedback and Sentence Feedback together. Error Feedback can be seen either by hovering over a red box or through clicking the tab. This shows specific words that have been used incorrectly with explanations and suggested corrections. Sentence feedback gives you an idea of the general quality of each sentence. The colours range from green to red via yellow and orange. Green suggests a well-written sentence. Yellow and orange suggest the system believes the sentence is acceptable. Red suggests the sentence may have a few problems. Working from this advice, you can amend and resubmit the text and measure any improvement. Okay, thank you so much, Alistair. So this just gave you a little taste of what this app can do. And, and uh, the key point that, that I want you to get across here is the idea of feedback, which is incredibly useful for learners. As we all know, we're all teachers, but we also know that a teacher cannot provide feedback to every single learner on a regular basis. And so this is where, again, the technology and the machine can step in to support the teacher because, because um, the, the feedback at different levels can then be used by learners to further their learning. And also, I think this is a really useful way to develop learner autonomy as well. And I do think autonomy is a key issue when it comes to, when it comes to a successful learning. If learners are doing something on their own and they're getting feedback, not from a human being, but from a machine, then they more, they, they have to decide themselves what to do with it and how to take it forward. They can obviously take it to the teacher, but I think it gives them the opportunity to, to become more autonomous in, in their learning through this through this app. So if you if you uh, think this may be useful, do let your students know about it and uh, and they could possibly benefit from it. And what and when they're doing it they can also be helping a research study that we're carrying out here. We're trying to get as much writing from different learners as possible. Okay. Somehow this has gone blank. I'm not sure, Alistair. Hi, e Evelina. Um, sorry, so you click on the first. My slides are not moving, I'm afraid. OK, I, I, um, I can now see evidence for learning. Um, can you not see that on, on the slide? I can't. Uh, I can't see. I don't know what you're seeing, but I'm j I just have a blank page in front of me where the slide should be. Let me just go. Let me try again. Okay. Um, can can um, members of the audience can you see the the slide? So I'm just say, Evelina, we can, I I can certainly see it fine. This side it looks like um, the rest of the audience can see it. So, um, would you like me to okay. click on when we get to the um, the relevant points for the next slide or so? Yes, can you tell me where you are? I'm so sorry about this. So what can you see now? 
And I can now see evidence for learning. Okay, so I'll just tell you when to click. Thank you, Alistair. I'll, I'm just working blind now because I have no idea what Sorry. you can see. But this is really just to sum up. It, it's my summary slide for you uh, about learning-oriented assessment and technology. And I have to say the two really need to go together in order to, to be successful. And one is that um, there's, there's evidence for learning which is something that is very important for teachers and there's broader evidence for learning here because the, the what happens outside of the classroom through the online parts of a course which are supported by technology is a, is, is is part of that um, the record that we develop for this for the student okay if we can click on to the next one Alistair thanks okay yep. record keeping yes is another element, is another part of this. Teachers, we need to know what's happening at our learners. We are stretched for time, we've got lots of learners. So the idea of the technology supporting record keeping is again a very, very positive aspect of learning-oriented assessment because it helps the teacher decide and, uh, and, and adjust their, their teaching. Okay, next one. Flipped classroom. Flipped classroom. Now this is a concept I haven't mentioned so far, but it is such a big concept in learning and teaching that you probably have come across it and you're familiar with it. And I and I thought I wanted to mention it and introduce it. And I would say that learning oriented assessment very much supports a flipped classroom. The idea of a flipped classroom is that what traditionally happened in the classroom, let's say the teacher explaining grammar rules, doesn't have to happen in the classroom. That can happen before or after with the help of technology. And what happens in the classroom is the stuff that you can't do with technology. It's the stuff such as interaction, group work, pair work, discussing, explaining. So that's where, again, technology and integration of assessment and learning overlaps with the flipped classroom because the technology can take the part of the lesson outside of the classroom. And, and the teacher can then focus on the elements of teaching, the elements of, of, of language development that, that you need, that uh, the technology is, is limited with. Okay, next one, please. Feedback. There is feedback. As I've shown you, the technology is very, very good at providing feedback. That's what teachers are very good at as well. The technology cannot measure every aspect of a learner's speaking, and it certainly cannot measure every aspect of a learner's writing, but it can give some feedback. And then the teacher can supplement that feedback. But the technology can provide feedback outside of the classroom. It can help learners become more autonomous as well. So, so a very, very positive feature of, of, of learning or assessment of technology is the possibility of feedback. And finally, ownership, ownership and motivation. That's it. Ownership and motivation. And I think all of these elements of learning oriented assessment combined give, I believe, more of a sense of ownership to learners. And that increases motivation as well, because learners don't just expect to sit in a classroom and to have the teacher, the expert, give them knowledge and put knowledge in their heads anymore. What they are starting to, what is starting to become part of their learning experience on a regular basis is that that um, um, the split between the teacher and what the learner is doing outside of the space that the teacher occupies. So it's the learning inside and outside which makes learners much more involved with their learning as well. So this is just a summary of learning-oriented assessment. And if we can move on to the next slide, which is my penultimate slide, if you would like to find out more. So this is, um, this is for people who may want to learn a bit more. The example I've given you is from a book. It's an academic book from the Studies in Language Testing series, which is published by Cambridge University Press, and it's called Learning Oriented Assessment. Now, I should make it clear that this is not a teacher's guide. This is more the theory behind learning oriented assessment. What are the theories that have supported this, this approach to learning and assessment? But if you're interested, I would recommend this book. So it's published by Cambridge University Press, and it's called Learning Oriented Assessment. And I've given you one more, one more um, um, suggestion for, for future, future um, learning for you, and that's the Cambridge English Teacher website, which is an online professional development community. And there is a unit, there is a course, I should say, not a unit, but a course on learning-oriented assessment that unpacks this concept in, in a few more details. So if you're more interested, definitely take a look at these two resources. And there's a final slide, which... Um, I think that's for uh, Alistair. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Evelina. And my apologies for the, uh, the slide difficulties at, at the end. I hope everyone else was able to, to see the slides. So thank you for a really interesting session. And we'll, we'll move on to the questions now. So um, 
the first question we've got, um, please um, everyone type your questions into the chat. Um, Anthony Ash asked a question about the um, learner autonomy slide. When you started off by saying that um, you're asking whether students understood the goals of every lesson. And Anthony asked um, why students needed to understand the goals of each lesson. I would say that it's important because it gives them an aim. It tells them what they need to be aiming towards. So, for example, let's take an example from, from something else. Let's say I'm trying to develop my swimming. I'm trying to become a better swimmer. I need to, I'm, going to be, I'm going to be better and more efficient at working on my swimming if I have a specific goal in mind. Let's say I, I, I would like to be able to swim for 10 minutes or I'd like to be able to swim whatever, one kilometer. So I think that clarity about where you want to get to, which is what the goals are, helps you in getting there because it makes you more autonomous, it makes you more aware of what you need to do to be able to get to that final goal. So that would be my answer. I hope I've, 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 I've helped you with that response. Thanks. We've had quite a few questions about the Write and Improve app. Um, Andrew McGill asks where we can find it. Um, Marianne asks whether it's available for phones and tablets. And Joanna Granville Edmonds asks how much it is. Okay. Um, you can find it just by typing in, uh, going on Google and, and typing in Cambridge English Write and Improve. It is a free app. So anyone can use it, and there is no fee attached to it. Um, I should say it's a better version. So that means this is our first iteration of the app, but it's still very, very good. Um, and um, whether it is, it is, it is. You can use it on tablets. I'm not sure about using it on mobile phones, but I would say, well, I don't know. Do learners type? Do learners do longer pieces of writing on their phones? I'm not sure about that. So. Um, it, it, it may not be available on phones, but that, what I'm saying is that's possibly not, not a huge limitation. So it's free, look it up online, and encourage your learners to use it. Okay, and I've just pasted, um, pasted it into the, uh, the website, into the chat box for everyone. Okay, Great, um, a question from Magdalene Lotter, who asks um, whether self-assessment would count as reflection on learning. I would say very much so. Because self-assessment, again, makes learners much more aware of what they need to be doing. It's difficult to do self-assessment, though. I think maybe that's something that a lot of you might have found out. But, but yes, reflection on learning, self-assessment would be, in a way, reflection on learning because you're, you're looking at what you can and what you can't do. But you need to, I really think that you need to teach your learners to do self-assessment. You can't just expect them to take, let's say, a scoring sheet and grade themselves on let's say grammar vocabulary and so on you need to work if you're teaching Cambridge exams for example and and you're preparing your learners for a writing exam take the assessment criteria and the different descriptors the different statements work with your learners make that into a lesson in itself so they understand what they mean so that they can then apply them to their own to their own achieve to their own writing and, and through that self-assessment, I think they're going to become better, they're going to reflect better on their learning as well. Thank you. Um, a question now from Carlos Moyanina, who says, um, bearing in mind that teachers are always under severe time constraints, how regularly do you think um, we can apply LOA when we're, you know, we're teaching grammar, vocabulary, and so on in, in each class? Yeah, it's a very good question. I would say, Carlos, that the key point here is it's not about how frequently to apply LOA. I would say LOA is a philosophy change. It's a philosophy. It's a paradigm shift in thinking. So if you start thinking and take little, you know, give yourselves little challenges perhaps, but if you just start thinking about integrating learning and assessment, that's really the key point. How can you, in every lesson, do enough tasks that give you data, give you evidence of where your learners are, and then use that data, use that evidence to plan your next lesson or to plan maybe different extension activities that you can give different groups of learners. So it's more about adopting the philosophy and not how often you do it. And if, you, if you're aware of it and if you're trying to integrate learning and assessment continuously, then I think you'll find that you're more and more often putting principles of LOA into your, into your teaching. Thank you. Um, question now from Jörn Okbjörn, who asks um, about adopting learners, 
um, learning oriented assessment for young learners, whether you have any suggestions on that, how that might work? Um, obviously, the kind of assessment you do with young learners is different, um, but the principles, I would say, are the same. So you need to be building in learning checks or assessment checks throughout the lesson, and, uh, and there, there would be whatever assessment you do with young learners, which is much more, uh, let's say, based on pictures, based on visuals, to do with storytelling, for example, or to do with words that they're learning at the moment, such as colors or, 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 or animals, whatever the content is. But I would say the principles are the same. You have to build in the assessment checks throughout and get evidence, collect the data from that, so that then you, you decide what to do the, the next time you see those young learners. So I'd say the approach would be the same, but obviously the kinds of assessments you do would be more, more geared to young learners. Hey, thanks. Um, a question now from Gladys Sopakua, who um, asks about how you can make this work with a class with a large number of students. Exactly. It's, 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 it, that's a brilliant question. That's the challenge of most teachers, large number of students. And that's why I, came, I, I come back to, the, to the, um, one of the key points of the presentation. It's about technology and learning-oriented assessment. A teacher with 35 students that are mixed ability cannot do this on a regular basis because the teacher is a human being with limited resources and you know lots of other things demanding his or her time outside of the classroom so that's why you need technology you need to be able to give your learners tasks that then the technology supports so that's where the write and improve app would be very useful because it can provide feedback on their writing at different levels, They're diff they have different levels of writing, the app can give them that feedback. That's where the Empower course comes in because that's a thought through whole. It's, 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 an entire, it's a whole course, it's not just little bits and pieces of digital apps. So, so that's where something that is comprehensive and is integrated in a, integrates the learning, and the learning and assessment in a systematic way is very, very useful. So I would say, as a teacher of a large class, you need to pick small challenges, but you, it, it'll be very challenging to apply it on a regular basis if you don't use any other additional materials. Okay, thank you. A question now from Anthony Ash, who asks whether you see similarities between learning-oriented assessment and uh, differentiated learning. I do. I, I think they're similar. Um, differenti differentiated learning is about targeting learning to individual needs. So if you have students of different, different, uh, at different ability levels, then you do different kinds of teaching to, to enable their learning. And that's what learning-oriented assessment tries to do, to allow each learner to get a personalized experience through, allowing the, through helping the teacher to track progress, through collecting feedback through allow, helping the teacher to adjust their teaching style, teaching cycle. But again, you need technology to support the teacher to do this. Technology can allow the teacher to do differentiated teaching and learning because that can happen outside of the classroom with the help of the machine. So I'd say there's overlap, but, but the, 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 again, technology comes into supporting the teacher in doing that. Yeah, thank you. A um, couple of questions now from Christine Sotaro Chandli about um, Write and Improve. Um, Christine asks whether the assessment criteria are, are clear on, on, on it and also um, whether teachers can access the students' work. Teachers can access the students' work, I believe. I need to double check this, but um, they can only access it if the, teach, if the student if the student shows it to them. Um, so it's, this is not something where teachers can log in and get a, get a grade book or a profile of their learners. We're not there yet. So this is just a better version. But the, the app provides evidence of, let's say, first attempt, second attempt, and so on. So the learners can bring that to the teacher. And that's where the teacher can see how, how, uh, how they've done. Uh, okay, so it's, it's not a learning management system at, the, at this it, present stage. Exactly. Thank you. That's a very, very good way of putting it. Yes, it is not a learning management system. It is just, it's a digital app which could possibly become part of a learning management system. And in fact, um, we're considering using it much more that feedback function in some of, some of our, our products. Uh, and the first question was about the, the rating criteria. Again, yeah. a great question. Currently, the learners don't have information on what the, the um, assessment criteria were, partly because every time you have machine scoring, every time you have automated assessment, 
there, there is a long list of features that the machine takes into account to give a mark, to give a score. In this case, to, you know, to give a color coding. And so that's, quite, that's not user friendly. A step beyond that could be to allow learners to say, OK, um, give them scores, on, let's say, on the grammar. So all the features the machine uses for grammar are bundled together. All the features the machine uses for Lexis are bundled together. That hasn't been done yet with Write and Improve. It could possibly be a next iteration of the, of the app. So currently, I would say, no, that's a bit of a black box for the learners and the students. OK, thanks. Um, a question from Yuan Okbyun, who asks whether you think that uh, technology will, will replace teachers anytime soon. I would say definitely not. And, and I say this with, with you know, a very, very clear conscience and a hand on my heart. I really believe that technology cannot replace the teacher. And, and something that I say often in my presentations is technology is not the teacher. Technology is the teacher's assistant. Technology assists the teacher and supports the teacher. But it is not going to replace the teacher because learning is not just about a machine giving you scores and feedback. Learning is about interaction. It's about communication. It's about knowing. Um, it's about learning through being in a social environment. And that's something the machine cannot do. So there is a very, very definite role of teachers. But I would say what the, t the machine can do is it can remove from the, from the responsibility of the teacher stuff that the machine can do. The teacher shouldn't have to do drills of grammar in the classroom. The machine can do that. And then the teacher does extension activities with that grammar and takes it further through communicative and, and more, more uh, open activities in the classroom. Uh, thank you. I've got to say that uh, these, these webinars would be extremely dull if, um, if all the teachers involved were replaced by technology. I agree. Uh, <laughs> nothing, nothing for me to do whatsoever. A um, question now from Zuhaya Slimi, who asks if you could explain a little more about diagnostic assessment, please, perhaps with some examples. Diagnostic assessment means you put a diagnosis on something. It, it, it's like when you go to the doctor. The doctor has to give you a diagnosis of what, what, what's wrong with you, basically. In learning, diagnostic assessment means you focus on what the strengths and the, weakness and the weaknesses of the learner are, so what the learner can do and what the learner cannot do. And you build on that. So one example of diagnostic assessment could be when you when you do a writing a writing when you collect the writing sample from students, then you the feedback that you give includes points about this is what you do well. So you have, for example, accurate grammar. You have um, uh, um, a fairly wide range of vocabulary, and these are some things to work on. Let's say paragraph structure or signaling the organization of, of your writing a little bit more clearly. So diagnostic really means you, you're diagnosing the strengths and the weaknesses of the learners in, uh, so that then they can, so they and the teacher can use that information to, to build on, well, to develop their, their limitations. OK, thanks. Um, could you say a little more, please, about um, learning-oriented assessment and the, um, the Write and Improve app in re with regard to EAP, please, your teaching in an EAP context? Um, so EAP meaning English for Academic Purposes, um, for those that um, yes. are not familiar. It, it is possibly, it, it can still work in that you put a piece of writing in, and that can be writing on, on an academic topic, and then you get feedback on it. It, it depends what kind of academic writing you're putting into the system, though. If this is a very long, let's say, 1,000-word essay, then, then um, the focus or the, the issues with that essay may, may not necessarily be the core aspects of language, such as grammar and lexis, but it might be more to do with organizing of the, of the piece of writing, signaling main points and supporting points. So I guess what I'm trying to say is with academic writing, the issue may be maybe features of language which the machine is not very good at capturing, the machine is not very good at giving feedback on. But that doesn't mean that it's not good at, 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 at academic English writing. So I'd say your learners should, should try it. it. It it depends what the problems with their writing are. If they need feedback on organization or main idea and supporting ideas, the app cannot help them with that. If they need feedback on their grammar, on their lexis, then the app can definitely help them with that. OK, brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Evelina. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today.
But don't forget, everyone, that you can join us next week at the same time of day, but on a Thursday rather than on Tuesday, when Alan Davenport will be back for a webinar on ideas for using authentic practice tests in IELTS classrooms, focusing particularly on writing. Um, that's not on the um, on our website just yet, but that should be on the website from the very latest um, noon UK time tomorrow. So um, please uh, please join us for that. The recording for, of today's webinar should be live on our blog and our YouTube channel by Friday, and we'll send you a certificate by Tuesday next week. So thank you everyone for attending. Thank you particularly for your questions. Thanks to my colleagues Chris, Eleanor, and Jess for um, for live tweeting, for answering questions, and helping with any technical difficulties. And most of all, thank you to you, Evelina, for an excellent and very interesting session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.